Good evening and welcome to the Ventura County Master Gardener Speaker Series. Today's presentation, Growing Winter Vegetables, will be about an hour with time for questions, but we ask that everyone stay muted due to the number of the people on the call. If you have a question, please use the chat box at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to as many as possible. Some during the talk if it's pertinent and then we'll wait for others for after the talk. Our speaker today is Harry Lee, who has been a master gardener since 2013. He will talk to us today about how to grow a winter vegetable garden. You will learn what types of veggies grow best in the winter months, and you'll receive information on soil prep, irrigation, and pest control. Please check out our website and Facebook page for more information and registration for upcoming classes. Please see these addresses in the chat box, as well as our email address for our Master Gardener Helpline. Harry, if you could queue up that first. At it, on its way. Okay. I wanted to talk to everybody about um, Asian citrus psyllid. If you have citrus trees in your yard, please check the new growth for the baby psyllids. They will look like on your screen on the left top picture. Um, ACP can carry a disease that is deadly to citrus. If you find evidence of it on your trees, go to the nursery to get spray for the trees. It is important to control ants in your trees also as they keep beneficial insects from doing their jobs. For more information on ACP, please go to our website. Again, that's located in the chat box. All right, Harry, your turn. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Let's get to winter vegetables or winter vegetables in Ventura County. Uh, if you don't happen to be living in Ventura County, um, welcome to the club. And if you have questions at the end of the presentation about how some of this information might apply, please feel free to ask. Um, the biggest difference is being um, Frost free, free times and, um, well, frost free times. Okay. Why are we gardening in the winter? Uh, we'll use less water, not quite as big a benefit as it, as it was in years prior, but still, um, what little rainfall we are getting will still, um, allow you to grow vegetables um, with less irrigation. Uh, fewer garden pests. Again, not quite as great as it was 10 or 15 years ago. Um, the warmer weathers that we ex weather that we experience now uh, allows some of those little buggers to survive uh, into the winter and they can present some issues, but it is still going to be, um, I think a much easier battle than you will typically see in your summer garden. Um, the big one is the sensitivity is to um, harvest time. When your zucchini is ready to go, it's ready to go. You don't really get to wait a day or two. Um, and I think you'll find if you're growing broccoli or cabbage, cauliflower, those sorts of things, um, not only will a few days not matter, um, quite as much, uh, but you can oftentimes get away with a whole week. Um, cooler temperatures are often a lot more um, fun uh, when you have serious garden work to do. It's a lot easier to do your weeding in 65 degree temperatures than it is 85 degree temperatures. And of course, because we live in, um, or at least primarily live in Ventura County, we can. So why shouldn't we? Um, we have a, many of us have a, a 365 day frost free um, climate. It's relatively warm compared to most of the country. And there just really isn't any reason why you can't uh, grow quite a few different uh, winter vegetables. Um, 
I can see this is a partial list of the cool weather vegetables. It's um, there's 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 many others that you could uh, probably put on your list. These are the ones that people I think most often grow. They're certainly the ones I most often grow, um, and they will all do well outside of hard frosts uh, in all of the winter months, starting well starting in October, which of course is now gone, um, but um, all the way through um, March, when you're getting ready to uh, clean up the garden and get ready for your summer vegetables. And that's really it. Um, you want to start the winter garden when your summer garden is uh, winding up, as you're pulling out the tomatoes, squash and the other th beans. Um, it's time to plant uh, things like broccoli or cabbage. Um, cauliflower is an another prop popular one. If you, Brussels sprouts are a little trickier because they take a little longer, but uh, if you're not worried about frost, it's time to put the, bro or the Brussels sprouts in too. Um, there were last last week when we did the class, there were a lot of questions on frost dates. And so I've added um, in the next two bullet points. First of all, do you have frost? I, I haven't had one in the three years I've been in Santa Cruz County. And I have not, um, I, can't, I can't remember the last time I experienced one in Ventura, um, in the city of Ventura. It was probably about 10 or 12 years ago, I had a little frost damage on my fruit trees. I don't remember any in the winter garden in particular, but I do remember some frost damage to my fruit trees. Um, for a lot of us, it, it's frosts are pretty minor. Uh, if it's not, if you get um, if you get real periods of of weather where the temperature drops below 32 degrees, you can still have a winter garden. Um, you can either if your um, frost dates are you know, I don't know, November 15th to January 15th, you can plant before and after. If um, if you're not getting snow on the ground, uh, row covers work very well and they're available um, at local garden stores all over the internet. Most of the big seed houses uh, like Johnny's or you know, whoever um, will sell row covers and it's simply a cover for your hopefully raised beds. Um, just in case you're not familiar with, because you're gonna know better than um, anybody else what kind of frost you get in your microclimate. Um, when I ordered my onions this year, I put down a very early sh um, shipping date because I'm having trouble getting them to all grow up and be big by the time I wanna start pulling them up to put in this, some of the early summer stuff. And I got a contact back from the, um, from the vendor saying I was ordering too early. Well, I don't have a frost. Um, I don't really have any, any serious concerns about frost killing my onions. I'd like to get them in the ground now. And they, won't, they want me to wait a while until um, uh, the USDA plant hardiness zone says I'm not gonna get any more frost. So you probably know as much as they do about your climate or certainly your microclimate. But if you want support and help, um, those three references, the UC Garden Web uh, all has uh, an explanation of um, first and last frost dates. And it also has the links, though today when I double checked on it, uh, some of the links uh, to other websites were not working. Um, the USDA has a hardiness zone schedule, as does sunset. I have a preference for sunsets only because it's far more detailed. I think there are 28 or 30 sunset climate zones, and I think there are fewer than 20 in the USDA um, plant hardiness uh, list. 
they're both available, um, not only for California, but um, in the case of Sunset, for the whole Western United States, and of course the USDA for the entire United States. And um, it, it provides you a way of, of um, learning about your first and last frost dates. Okay. One thing to, <laughs> one thing that we have to, um, that we have to worry about a little bit more these days. Well, Ventura County often gets um, a week or two of warm weather in um, <clears throat> as, as late as, as uh, November. I, mean, I, I can remember some pretty warm Thanksgivings. Warm weather can cause bolting, um, which is simply uh, forcing the, let's say broccoli, head to flower instead of maintaining its um, edible quality and staying, staying nice and tight. If the weather warms up, you need to water more. Um, it's not necessarily going to cure the problem. If you have a week of 80, 85 degrees in the middle of November, you're probably, you probably get to replant uh, things like, uh, bro especially broccoli and cauliflower. Um, it's not going to be quite such a big problem as some of the other uh, vegetables. Um, even the uh, leafy greens um, will do okay. Spinach has a tendency to bolt. Uh, and when it starts to go to seed, the flavor isn't nearly as good. Watering can help. It won't necessarily keep it from happening, but water if you keep those plants, um, uh, keep the, the soil mo moist while the weather's warm, you have a better chance of surviving. And if not, if the plants start to flower, they're for the most part, not going to be very good on the dinner table. And you probably want to look at replanting. Um, things like carrots, radishes, turnips, um, beets even, will all direct seed very well. Um, and they'll be a little less subject to, um, especially the warm weather, and they'll do quite well with a with a um, a row cover, um, as, as will the greens. Onions are a curious plant. Um, I would recommend, for the most part, that you find onion sets, the bulbs. Onions are a biennial, so that first year that onion plant is not going to produce much of a bulb. You can have a whole lot of green onions, but you're not gonna get uh, much in the way of a bulb on, a, on that first year's plant. If you order onion sets from a, either the, you know, get them at the local nursery or, or order them online, um, you'll get an onion that'll bulb um, in the three to six inch range. Uh, you can get some pretty good onions out of, uh, out of your winter garden if you start with, uh, with the sets rather than the seeds. Nothing wrong with the seeds, but you're really looking at a two-year project more, much more than you are a single year. Ventura County, be careful. Uh, the nurseries in Ventura County, in my experience these days, are, are pretty good about stocking the right kind. I, I don't I don't have quite the same level of confidence in the big box stores. Um, I, don't, I don't really have any examples where they didn't provide short day onions uh, locally, but uh, they worry me a little bit more and I order mine online. But a short day onion is what you're after. It requires 10 to 12 hours of, of sunlight to uh, bulb, which will, it will do in the late winter, early spring. And like I said, given enough time, you can get a easily a five inch um, uh, onion bulb out of uh, any of the short day onions there. They also you get, get varieties that store pretty well. And um, so if you have a mixture of keepers and, and uh, red and yellow and white, uh, you, can, you can have quite a, quite a selection of onions if they're uh, something that you enjoy. 
you're probably switching to intermediate day onions north of San Luis Obispo County. Um, they require more like 12 to 14 hours of daylight. Uh, it's something like the 32nd to 35th uh, um, latitude. And it's there's there's a lot of overlap. Um, intermediate day onions um, growing a little further north will will grow a little faster. So you but you won't get the you won't get the same size bulbs out of them. They won't get as quite as big, but they will be ready for harvest a little faster. Okay. This is more where to plant. Um, I'm not sure I've ever given a talk that didn't <laughs> didn't uh, greatly encourage you to use raised beds. It's no different from your summer garden than it would be for your winter garden. Uh, it's a lot easier to manage your soil condition, your moisture availability. Um, you'll weed less. The soil will warm up faster, which is really more of a summer thing than a winter thing. But um, it will be. Um, easier to control pests. If you have to put down row covers for a winter garden, it's easier to do uh, with a raised bed. And I've seen some pretty creative ones. Um, they, um, they can be quite the garden art. We'll get some more quick pictures in here. Um, if you don't have raised beds, I give it serious consideration. Um, and as you can see from the pictures, they can be uh, truly raised beds to accommodate a whole variety of circumstances. Alrighty, kind of along the lines of a raised bed are container gardening, or is container gardening. Almost any vegetable from your garden will grow in a pot if the pot is big enough. Um, you're not going to have a lot of success with a eight or 10 inch carrot in a six inch pot, but you would have a lot of success or should have success with a four inch carrot in a six inch pot. Um, you can grow um, pretty much all of the greens in pots. Uh, and again, it's easier to control um, soil quality. Uh, soil condition. You have to be very careful with the watering. Um, not only does the container need good drainage, but you need to make sure that it doesn't dry out. Um, winter vegetables are really not that much more tolerant of, of overly dry conditions than would your summer plants be. Um, and all you really need for your uh, six inch pot for for your four inch carrots is a good potting soil. But again, keep that watering regular, regular, especially if it warms up a lot. Uh, pots will just dry out faster than um, a larger amount of soil in a, in a raised bed, uh, like the ones we were just looking at. Uh, if you're gonna grow broccoli, uh, Brussels sprouts, um, I'd say cabbage, probably even cauliflower, you probably wanna at least 10 inches, if not 12 or 14 in the, in the diameter of the pot and as deep as you can, as deep as you can make it because they're pretty big plants, especially um, broccoli and cabbage. Okay, seeds or plants. Uh, I will warn you that uh, virtually everything I plant, I grow from seed. I have a bias. Um, I think you can have a greater, if you take care of the seeds from year to year, you can have a greater variety to choose from if you plant from seed. Um, I believe that the quality may very well be higher. As much faith in, and um, um, confidence in the quality of the most of the local nurseries in Ventura County, um, they're getting their plants from a wholesaler and. You don't necessarily get um, 
you can introduce things into the garden you don't want in your garden uh, from a nursery plant. Um, hasn't happened to me in, gosh, probably 15 or 20 years. It's been a very long time, uh, but it is a possibility. Uh, you will need this. The, let me hit the containers first. You can see from the slides that virtually anything will work um, for starting a seed. Uh, I save and, and people give me um, the little black nursery pots you see in the upper picture, the six packs, um, the three and four inch pots. I, I just save them and they'll, they'll last several plantings before they wear out. They just need to be clean. So if you get, if you, if you've bought something in a six pack, if you wash that six pack, um, a little bleach wouldn't hurt, but soap and water is almost as good. Just make sure that it's as clean as you can make it. Uh, so you're not spreading any, um, any disease from the, the, um, six pack to your garden. It, cleanliness is just really important. The other thing that's really important is lighting. Um, summer or winter, uh, you have to have a light source for uh, plants that you're growing from seed. You know, it doesn't have to be expensive. Um, a windowsill might work, especially if you're good at rotating the, the, um, the plants, uh, assuming you have a nice, bright, sunny window. Uh, I mean, that, that, that might do it. You don't have the same demands of temperature and hours that you do with a summer garden, uh, where it's, it's probably my, my uh, light fixtures are probably set to 14 hours. And um, they're all on heating mats. I don't use the heating mats in the winter most of the time, and um, you can turn the, the uh, light times down also. But you do need a good, sufficient light source, and um, it needs to really cover your container. Now, if you've only got a couple of six packs, that's easy. If you're going to be a little bit more um, industrious, like that picture on the bottom, Make sure that your light fixture is at least as large as the container that you're planting in. Okay. This is the only soil preparation um, that, I'll, that I'll really talk about today. Um, I mean, it, it's worth of course, weeding and, and turning over your raised beds or your, your soil, um, but you got to fertilize. Uh, your summer garden has just taken everything that your soil has to give you, and um, it's, it's time to, to give it back a little support. You can use compost. Um, it's great stuff. It certainly will uh, improve the quality of the soil, but you want to make sure that you're getting enough of the primary nutrients to um, support the heavy feeders that you have in the winter. Uh, like, again, we're right back to cabbage and broccoli and cauliflower, um, carrots, uh, really they all require a good, decent level of nutrients, but, but some require a little bit more, especially, well, all the heavy feeders, we're talking about nitrogen. Um, What I usually do, um, especially if I'm, if I'm adding soil um, or compost to a raised bed in between the summer and winter plantings, uh, fertilizing is easy. I, according to the package directions, I use a granulated uh, or granular uh, organic fertilizer. I spread it across the, the bed in the, um, according to package directions. And I turn, uh, turn in the, the soil or compost that I'm adding. 
um, to bring the soil level back up to where I want it to be because it will compress a little bit. It, you'll lose some with the as you pull up the summer plants. And so if not every year, every other year, I'm adding um, soil or compost back to my raised beds and doing the fertilizer at the same time is, is really easy, um, really straightforward. You can have soil tests done if you're worried about the nutrients, if you have a particular problem. Um, I don't think they're terribly expensive. Um, you could contact the helpline. And while we get back to answering questions, I'll put the helpline numbers and uh, email address up on the screen uh, because I skipped it with the uh, ACP slides uh, at the beginning of the presentation. Um, you can also side dress or add fertilizer as you go. I, I usually do, especially for the bigger plants, um, like broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts. Um, and when I do that, I usually use liquid fertilizer rather than the granulated because I have a, I personally have trouble getting the granulated to absorb into the soil. It tends to crust on the surface of the soil. And because I don't want to be digging around there too much, disturbing the roots of the vegetables, I just switch to a liquid fertilizer. Um, same difference, doesn't matter what you use, but you need to fertilize and then you, when your winter garden's over and you're going back to summer, you need to fertilize again. Any vegetable fertilizer will work. Really anything, 10, 10, 10, any, any good fertilizer will work. Um, you'll find the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, the three number code that's on every fertilizer. You'll find those um, and that's quite, helpful. You'll rarely find the micronutrients, um, of which I've listed three. Um, you have to do a little bit more digging if you're, um, you're going to figure out what they are. Really, a soil test is, is the digging you're going to do. Um, I think you can get them at, you could get a soil test uh, kit and probably $20, $25 at um, one of the good local nurseries and give it a try. I've used them. I think they work pretty well. Um, if you want to have it professionally done again, check with the helpline. They might have a reference or a referral for you. Okay. Used to be we never talked about water when um, talking about winter gardens. But we do now, rainfall is intermittent, will be intermittent this year. Um, you don't want your soil to dry out in the winter any more than you want it to dry out in the summer. So when that top half inch to inch of the soil is dry, it's time to water. It doesn't matter whether it's December or July. But you need to make sure that those plants don't dry out. They'll be a lot happier and they'll be a lot better on your dinner table. Okay, I think I sort of promised that you'd have fewer garden pests in the, in the winter. And for the most part, I think that's true. Um, the bigger, in terms of size, not, not trouble, um, the bigger pests, gophers, squirrels, mice, rats, birds are still around. Um, the only, the only good method for controlling gophers that I've ever seen are raised beds with hardware cloth, not chicken wire on the bottom. And I've never known anybody um, who's had gophers in their raised beds with hardware cloth um, properly stapled to the bottom of the bed. It's a process that you'll have to do again in four or five years, um, but you can be kind of lucky if chicken wire lasts two. Um, I've had reasonable, we don't have any squirrels anymore um, at the community garden where I have my plots. They moved on for some reason and I'm, 
I, I don't have a good explanation for that because they're all over the place otherwise. Uh, but I, using both um, wire and just bird netting, had reasonable success at controlling them, uh, especially in the winter. Um, a little more trouble in the summer because they work a little harder to get at uh, some of the summer vegetables like uh, my squirrels seem to like cucumbers. Um, if you have mice or rats, it's traps. Uh, and birds, of course, you can again control pretty well with just netting. Um, and most of the winter vegetables won't um, won't give you a lot of trouble with netting, except for peas. Um, they can <laughs> they can be a real challenge um, uh, because they tangle up in the netting, and it's just a pain when it when it's time to take them down. Okay. In most of our climate zones out here, the aphids just don't go away anymore. Um, they're not imp impossible to control by any means. Insecticidal soap, water, you, you can quite literally wash them off the plants. Um, and you can, the bait really refers more to the ants. Um, if you have dogs, especially, um, check with the nursery about um, which bait stations the, is, is better for um, the household dog. Um, you want to keep the ants out of, just like you want to keep them out of your um, citrus trees, your fruit trees in general, uh, because they really do encourage a lot of other pests. You want to keep them off your plants. Um, ants will um, keep predators like the lady beetle in the picture away from the aphid. Um, they're, they're quite aggressive because they like the, the honeydew produced by the, um, by the aphid. Other pests that you're likely to see, though, I don't see them nearly as much as I did in years past because it's drier, um, are slugs and snails. And you really just need to clear out any debris and um, gather them up and destroy them by hand. Um, and that's just a, a paper sack um, and into the garbage. Um, that, that's really all that it takes. Uh, you're you're going to find more of them if they're feeding, if you're getting a lot of damage, you're going to find more of them in the early evening hours after dark because um, they'll, they'll come out and feed. But um, a flashlight in a paper bag and your problem goes away, or at least mostly goes away. Um, the cabbage moth or cabbage worm is on here because I see them a lot in most gardens. Um, there are those pretty little moths with um, they actually have two spots on their wings, I think, um, though quite often you only see the one as you do in the picture. Uh, they lay eggs, um, kind of a, a beige or white um, colored egg. They'll lay them on the underside of the leaves. And when the caterpillars hatch out, uh, they will, um, Beat you out of house and home in a heartbeat. They're very, <laughs> they're very um, voracious eaters. You can try washing off the eggs or otherwise destroying them. Uh, catching the, the moth itself is a real challenge. Um, and then if they hatch out, you're back to picking them off by hand as you, as you find them. And the same thing, they can go into the trash in the paper bag. You know, you can squish them. Somebody asked about that last week um, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, you just don't want a bunch of them because then you'll attract ants. Um, so I usually just um, if I have very many, then I'm, I'll throw them out. 
Um, Cabbage moths will usually lay their eggs in a, in a cluster, anywhere from about a dozen to two dozen eggs. Um, and then just to make sure that they made it as hard as possible for us to keep track of them, they'll also sometimes just lay them randomly across the leaf, um, on the underside of the leaf. Uh, so just keep an eye out for them. Powdery mildew, my favorite summer and winter uh, problem. It's, a f it's actually several different kinds of fungus. Um, you can treat it with a fungicide. Uh, the picture in the middle is a pea that's um, suffering from powdery mildew. And I believe that's a leaf also uh, of a pea plant. It's where I see it, winter-wise, peas are where I see it the most. Um, in the summer garden, it's all over pretty much everything. But in the winter garden, it seems to be much more concentrated in, in, for me in, in peas. Um, if you're growing snap peas or sugar peas, the picture of the one there on the screen isn't particularly appetizing. It's not going to greatly affect the flavor of the, of the um, peas inside, but it certainly isn't very attractive. Um, and of course, as it kills the leaves of the pea, you're going to greatly reduce um, production. You can, th there's a bunch of formulas on the, um, on the internet, uh, baking soda, milk even. Uh, you can look those up. Uh, there are at least a couple of varieties or, or brands of um, organic fungus, fungal side that are available. It's, uh, it is a battle. Um, you, you, you need to start as soon as you see it and you need to keep after it. Um, prevention is the is the old, because once it prevention is the only thing that you can that you can do because once it settles into the tissue of the plant that particular tissue is dead um, and is in it can't be recovered so it is something that you need to stay after if you've got the problem and um, at least you can concentrate on just one part of um, one part of your garden, as opposed to uh, the summer where you can get it, tomatoes, squash, beans, everybody gets powdery mildew in the summer, but it's a little bit easier to deal with in the winter, as long as you stay after it. Um, okay. Let me... Let's take, let's, well, let me actually, um, let me go back to the, um, and put the helpline information up on the screen. If anybody has questions, now is a good time to write that in the chat box. Because we're done. <laughs> you don't have to just listen to me chat away. Okay, there's, if you don't get anything else out of it, um, the email address and uh, the phone number are there for the helpline. They're a great group of people. They have uh, tremendous resources to call upon. If you're sending them an email, send them pictures. Pictures are good. Um, the more you know, the more they can help you, but pictures are good. Okay, I have a couple of questions, Harry. Okay. Um, what about cover crops? Uh, cover crops are great. If you're not growing vegetables, I highly recommend that you use cover crops. Um, there should be something growing in your garden beds um, in, in the winter. And so if you're not going to grow vegetables, uh, put in a cover crop. Uh, or they're available um, 
at every nursery, um, you'll have some selection. Most of them are based on legumes, but oats and some of the other more grain oriented um, seeds are, are not uncommon. Um, everybody has them. So you run down to the nursery, buy a package of seeds and spread it through your bed and um, then you turn it over in the spring when you're ready to start planting the summer garden or a little bit before you're planting the summer garden. Okay. Um, can worm castings benefit your garden? The only problem with worm castings is typically the quantity. Um, they're, they're generally a wonderful um, fertilizer. Um, and good for the soil tilt and you know just the, the general quality of your soil. Um, I have trouble enough getting enough compost, uh, much less um, something like worm castings. But if you've got some, <laughs> I'd certainly be putting it in my garden. Okay. Um, another question: How can we increase the chances of pollination uh, because of the bee population? is going down? I assume that's what they mean. <laughs> um, well, if we're talking about, uh, if we're talking about um, the winter garden, I have never had a pollination problem. Um, I, in the, uh, honestly, in the summer, not only to help out the bees and the butterflies, but because I think they're pretty, I also plant flowers. Um, and you can find um, both butterfly friendly and, and bee friendly plant listings all over the internet. Um, most of the big seed houses also have uh, specific offerings in those categories. Um, if we're really just to concentrate on the winter garden for a minute, if we're if we're worried about the winter garden, I'm not sure that it's a big problem even with the reduction in pollinating insects, because it's not not just bees, but um, I mean, there are quite a few insects that we depend on for pollination, um, uh, native bees. But I can't remember. I I. Yeah, I can't remember having a, a particular pollination problem in the winter. Okay, um, can you mention a couple of types of mulch to use in the garden? Sure. Um, what would I, let me start with what I wouldn't use. I would stay away from, from the wood chip mulch, um, the bigger chunks like you might put on a garden path or around your fruit trees even, uh, or in a, um, a bed with, with uh, perennials in it, because your vegetable garden by and large is not a perennial garden, it's, a, it's an annual garden. And the wood chips are not gonna break down fast enough. You're, you're gonna be battling them in the soil. Um, so if you're adding, excuse me, if you're adding mulch, um, any good, well composted um, mulch will be, would be fine. Um, the one I've used most often is just straw, um, both summer and winter. It's easy to come by, it's not terribly expensive. You get some increase in weeds um, because the seeds are there, but uh, they're pretty minor, all in all, it's pretty easy to control. And um, if you are using drip irrigation, you want it on top of your drip irrigation. If you're watering by hand, just gotta make sure that you keep an eye on the soil itself. And given the fact that our climate is drier than it was 10 years ago, uh, a, a mulch of, of almost any sort is, is really a good idea because it will protect that soil moisture. It will cut down 
even in the winter, um, I would assume at least one watering a week goes away, if not maybe a couple. If you have a good couple inches of something as simple as straw or um, um, whatever you choose, just stay away from the um, from the larger bark type uh, or wood chip type mulches uh, because I think they'll make it a little harder for you when it comes time to do the summer garden. Okay. Um, this person is on the edge of Ventura County and they get a couple of hard frosts. Should they be covering with burlap on nights that they know there will be a frost? And is there anything less labor intensive? Um, Yes, they should. Uh, burlap is fine. Um, it's a little heavy, uh, but if burlap's what you got, and, and of course the price is right, um, then um, that should work reasonably well as a row cover. Um, and I, uh, outside of putting one up, uh, putting up a, a I don't want to say permanent, that's a, a bit of a misnomer, but a row cover that's in place most of the season that you really only remove to, uh, to harvest uh, is probably the only idea I have to offer. If you have hard frosts, uh, you either wait till your last frost date to plant, you know, if, let's say it's January 15th, just pull a date out of the air, then that's when you're planting your winter garden and you you want to start your plants indoors or um, make sure they're still available at the nursery so that you can squeeze them in before April 15th. Um, March, yeah, um, February, March, April, yeah, 90 days because most of the, most of the winter plants are going to want to, um, 75 to 90 days, um, most of the big plants. Okay, um, and here's another question, same as last week about using coffee grounds in the garden. <laughs> and I knew <laughs> I was gonna look it up and see if there was anything. Um, if you're a big coffee drinker, I wouldn't put all my uncomposted coffee grounds into the garden. Uh, they do tend to lower the pH, which isn't bad, but I don't, uh, you know, I think it's a, in small quantities, I think it's a, I think they're fine. Um, I just don't um, feel confident in recommending that they be put into the garden in any significant quantity. I mean, any, right? you know, I don't coffee filter a day kind of thing, <laughs> um, unless you have a big garden. Uh, compost them first with other stuff, of course. Okay, what about fixing nitrogen? Well, the nitrogen fixing theory is with legumes. Um, so peas work. Um, you know, I, I don't have a lot of science to back it up. I have no science to back it up. Um, but for years and years um, on the patio in Ventura, I would grow peas in the winter and my begonias in the summer. So I got too damn hot for the begonias. Um, and assuming that um, I didn't lose the peas to powdery mildew, uh, we had we had a pretty regular um, quantity of peas during the winter, and the begonias seemed happy enough. Uh, any legume, in theory, fixes nitrogen. Okay. Um, I just got raised planter beds and was planning to plant herbs and chilies. Can these be planted in the winter? Chilies, no. Peppers are um, really a high heat plant. Um, they want not only the long summer days, they want it to be warm 
summer days. Um, I have trouble um, here in coastal Santa Cruz County. Uh, the, the ocean's about half a mile, maybe three quarters of a mile away from my community garden. And my pepper production compared to what I'm used to in Ventura County is half because the days just don't get warm enough. Um, and, you know, the filtered sunlight may not be perfect either, but, but you're really looking at warm summer days. Um, I, I, I put my peppers in after the tomatoes and I, I'm pretty late on tomatoes compared to, to um, what most folks do. Um, the herbs, uh, sure, why not? Um, some of them are really not winter vegetables. They're not cool season vegetables. But um, assuming that we're in coastal California, I, I don't think um, I don't think you're going to be terribly disappointed on the herb side. I think on the chili side, you need to wait till April or May. Okay. Um, last question that I have so far anyway, would a two foot diameter planter pot be treated like a container or a small raised bed in terms of watering? Assuming that it's made out of, of well, clay or even concrete, um, I would think more container than raised bed in terms of watering. Um, you know, the, the rule is really the same. Don't let the soil dry out. Right. But it's how, how much more likely it is to dry out if you're in a pot. The smaller the pot, the more likely the soil is to dry. So by the time you've got something two feet in diameter, you're, you're getting up there pretty well. Um, you're not going to have the problems in that pot that I might have in a eight inch or 10 inch pot. Uh, your your um, you're just going to have an easier time with watering in a, in a two foot diameter uh, container. Okay, I have another two questions here. Do you mix regular backyard dirt with potting soil for a potted garden? No. This summer? No? <laughs> no, I'm no. sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Nicole. No, I mean, maybe that that's, makes sense. Um, she says that the only thing worked that she planted were tomatoes, so it's it was probably because she didn't use potting soil. Well, th that's a little bit harder to say. Um, you know, if if we were standing face to face, then I'd ask the twenty questions about you know when yes. you say they didn't do well. Why? You know, what what are you describing? Did they all die of disease, or did they just not flourish, or whatever? By and large, in any container, and especially in smaller pots. I want, I want potting soil. Um, I, I don't even mix the regular garden soil in with potting soil or, you know, whatever, whatever I'm putting in my raised beds. Um, I, I, I mean, there's just, there's just, Things in that in that in that garden soil outside my raised bed that I just assume not subject my tomatoes and peppers and you know whatnot to, um, and you you just most soils in Ventura County tend to be a little heavy. Um, I don't have quite the same problem up here, but it's instead it's it's. Um, Sometimes a little, I talk to people where it's a little too um, sandy, it's decomposed um, sandstone. And so it's not holding anything. Uh, whereas in Ventura County, we have just a lot of clay and you don't wanna put that in a pot. Um, it's gonna be hard to manage. It's gonna be hard to um, water. Um, it's gonna hold nutrients and that sort of stuff, but it's, 
get a good potting or planter mix and um, add your fertilizer and put your plant in it. Okay. Um, another question, is eggplant a perennial or an annual? All of the Solanaceae, tomatoes, peppers, eggplant are actually perennials. Mm -hmm. What I strongly discourage people from growing them as perennials um, because your production by and large is never going to be as good as it is that first year. And you're just looking to introduce um, both soil borne and non soil borne disease. Um, not only do we all like tomatoes, but there's about, <laughs> there's a couple of dozen diseases and, and pests that like tomatoes just as much. And if that plant stays in the same place for several years or eggplant, and go, we can go to eggplant, not quite as, as um, disease isn't quite as tough on eggplant as it is on tomatoes in my experience, but um, it's, it's the same plant family. And um, I, I would take it out and plant a new one next spring. And, you know, if you're doing a winter garden, great, do that. If, otherwise do the cover crop and, and fertilize. Um, but technically they are perennials. Okay. Um, my asparagus is getting yellow now that it's the fall. Is this normal? I planted them this year. Um, not, not to make fun of the question, there, there's no worse question to get than the leaves on my plant are yellow <laughs> because it can be a thousand different things. Yeah. Um, I, I would certainly take pictures of it and send it to the helpline. Um, I would also, if you're, if the asparagus is still big enough to notice, um, you, you want to trim it. You, you really want to cut those stalks off um, before it tries to set seed. Um, the yellowing could be nutrients. Um, I, I, it's probably not overwatering, just given our situation, unless you plant it. it well, even that's possible. And if you're in Ventura County in the in heavy clay soil, it's not not this, the favorite location for asparagus. Um, they like it, you know, a little lighter. Um, they like it a lot lighter. Uh, but um, it's probably not water. It's probably a nutrient deficiency, or or the if it's it could be that that those leaves leaves um, are. Um, are dying back too. It could be something as simple as that. But you don't want the asparagus to set seed now, which it will do, um, because then you're, especially after the first year, you're pulling uh, resources away from the uh, having the asparagus increase its root mass. So those little round green balls that appear on the asparagus are, are the seeds, and you, you want to cut them back. But I would take pictures and send it to the helpline. Um, and uh, I put the helpline uh, number in the chat box again. It's mgventura at ucdavis.edu. And it's right here also. Yeah. So <laughs> um, another question Are there vegetables that should not be planted next to each other? Um, y yes, um, companion planting, uh, there's a lot less science than we would like on companion planting, but there's a, there's an awful lot of, um, uh, I don't know what to call it, accepted knowledge accepted information. Um, 
I tend to plant my onions all by themselves. Um, I grow a lot of onions. I mean, that's so it's a bit of a luxury for me. Um, but in terms of the winter garden, um, that's really the only thing that I uh, that I avoid. Um, I just and again, I don't know that I have a lot of science for that, but um, I, I plant my onions more or less by themselves. I can look around the community garden. And I see a lot of people who stuck their onions here and there, and they seem to do just as well as mine. And there, you know, there are other nearby plants again seem to be doing just as well as mine. So, um, I'm. I, I I would rather see you plant that couple of onions in a corner of your raised bed than worry about whether or not it's going to um, injure your cabbage. Um, I, I wouldn't um, I wouldn't plant them next to carrots just for a more practical re or radishes because you're going to be harvesting them at different times and so you're disturbing disturbing the root system of one plant um, that's got to stay in the ground typically the onion um, while you're pulling up the carrots much much more quickly it's a 60 day versus a 90 or 120 day uh, plant so um, I, I would avoid I would avoid carrots and onions just from a practical standpoint and radishes and turnips and I don't grow parsnips, but same difference. Just don't plant two root vegetables that are going to be harvested at different times next to each other. Okay. It looks like um, that's it. That's it for the questions. Okay, cool. All righty. That's it. Yep. So thank you everybody for joining us. Um, be sure to look on our website for upcoming classes and um, take care, have great holidays and see you again. <laughs>